everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to Healing Hands. I'd like to welcome our special guest. Hi, I'm Kendra. Kendra Ogden. Today's topic is addiction and how it impacts your life. Kendra, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Kendra and I am an alcohol and addict in recovery. I've been in recovery seven and a half years now. And uh, I was addicted to um, pretty much anything when I first started. I started down on marijuana hallucinogenics in college. And, um, you know, I think I'm not a lot of other addicts and alcoholics. In the beginning, it was fun. Um, uh, when I was in high school, I did it for an identity because I didn't feel like I was enough just as I was. And so I used to work sin and drinking so that um, I used drugs and drinking so that um, I would fit into like a social social order, I guess. Um, as I got into college, um, I used drugs and alcohol to escape from reality and from life. Um, I was trying to escape my sexuality. I didn't understand about being a lesbian, and um, I used alcohol to be promiscuous with men so that I could have sex with men. And um, it was a lot of it was a lot of pain. But I didn't understand addiction or alcoholism, and I wasn't willing to admit that I had a problem, um, despite the fact that I had consequences, um, a DUI, a wrecked car. Um, I didn't finish college because of drinking. Um, so I had a lot of, I had a lot of different uh, consequences, but I didn't see myself as an alcoholic. Um, it wasn't until later in life that um, I, was a, I was actually a successful businesswoman, and um, I had money and time and Someone introduced me to cocaine, and I did cocaine for a number of years, eventually um, smoking crack cocaine, which was a lot of people would look at me and not think that I was a drug addict like that, but I was. Uh, I destroyed my life. I ruined my career. I lost friends. Um, the only family I had left really were my mom and dad, um, and they never, they never stopped being by my side. Um, they helped me. And so... Um, I couldn't have imagined eight years ago that I would be sitting here or that I would be sober or that I would have a life worth living. And so um, that's all really due to recovery. And um, my life got pretty bad. I mean, it's uh, my life pretty much existed to get high. And um, I manipulated for I manipulated people and money to to, to get my drugs. And um, it just was a really lonely place to be. That was pretty much all of my 30s. So. And you've overcome it. I've overcome that, yes. Now, I understand there's four core values to addiction. Yes. Well, the, the last treatment center that I, I went to taught me four core addictions. And um, what it means is that uh, I think a, a many addicts and alcoholics will, will understand this, but, but realize that when I'm talking about addiction, um, I can be talking about any kind of substance. I can be talking about any kind of process addiction, so gambling, shopping, sex, um, but we can also have addictions to relationships and to chaos. So the first core addiction I had was validation, which means that as a kid, I looked for everybody else to tell me that I was okay. I didn't know how to self-soothe. Um, I would I would try to be the best in the class, to be the fastest on the team, um, to basically I remember when someone put their arm around me and told me I was doing a good job, and I had this warm feeling kind of go over me. It reminds me of the first shot of whiskey you ever have. It's like a warm feeling in your chest. And I craved all of that, so I, I wanted that, I wanted to do that more. And that just meant that I never felt like I was okay just being Kendra. I had to be, I had to be performing. And that's how I, I hustled for my value. Like Brene Brown likes to say, hustling for value. So I hustled for my value. And uh, related to um, validation addiction is control addiction, which means I'll control a relationship between two people. Um, I'll be whatever that person wants me to be so that they'll love me and validate me. It kind of goes hand in hand. Um, it's very codependent in nature. Um, I will get into relationships that are unhealthy and I'll stay too long um, because I want so desperately to have that love and that value. Um, the third addiction is sensation. And sensation is obviously drugs, alcohol, gambling, the, the process addiction, substance addiction, addictions. But it's also uh, the rules don't apply to me. Um, I can do whatever I want to do because I'm selfish and self-centered. And these are all things that happen in active addiction, but when you take away drugs and alcohol or whatever you're addicted to, it can continue to happen. Um, and then the fourth addiction is crisis, so finding people that are broken so I can fix them. Um, again, very codependent. I think all of these uh, values or all of these core addictions are very codependent in nature. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I 
you've got a guess. Hi, Mia. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, the last one is crisis, which means I'll, I'll find people that are broken so I can fix them. But also, when things are going well, making sure that I bring chaos into the situation, not, not being okay with, with things being smooth. And so that was really, it was hard to, I think that the core addictions – Uncovering them and using, I use the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous to, to go over, to cover the 12, to 12, sorry, to cover the four core addictions. But um, once you do that, there's a lot of work still left to be done. Okay. That's interesting. And um, how, have, how are you different today using, or how have you, let's, let's go, how have you given back to the community without everything sure. you've learned? Um, so, once, so it took me a while to get into recovery. Um, I, I did get into some legal problems, and that kind of pushed me towards um, towards recovery. Um, I met my first sponsor in when I was in a treatment center, and she had everything that I wanted. She had a family, she had a career, and before that time, I never understood that I could have those things again. Even though I was a successful person, I didn't. I was so far away that I didn't think I could ever get back there again. And so she gave me some hope. And um, I first started having hope, and then I realized that I could go back to my old life and being alone, or I could go back and, and I could start doing, in this case, alcohol anonymous and treatment and start listening to people. And so I started taking suggestions. And um, when I learned about the four core addictions, they made so much sense to me that I, I knew I didn't want to go back again. And so I was willing to do anything that uh, they, they told me to do. So... Um, so one of the things they suggested was go to a halfway house. So I went to a halfway house, and I lived in a in a sober house for 11 months. And part of the requirements of living in those places was to get involved and get and get active in service. And so for me, what I do now for the community, um, I speak at treatment centers all, all across Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota, by the way. Um, and I, I go to I go to treatment centers all over Minneapolis, Twin Cities area. I sponsor women in the program. Um, I'm currently becoming a licensed alcohol and drug counselor, which is separate from recovery, but it's still, I hope to help the recovery community that way. Um, I'm always available. My phone is on 24 hours a day when people need to call me. Um, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> she's just, she's like, addicted. Her name is Boomerang because the she's Boomer. coming right back. Yeah. So anyway, um, I, but I'm just really active. And the good thing about sobriety now is that, uh, the things that I do to stay sober are no longer, an effort. It's a habit. So I pray and meditate daily. Well, I don't meditate daily. I'll be honest there. I should meditate daily. Uh, it would be better if I did. Um, but I pray daily. Um, I keep uh, my higher power in my in my life, which is not to say it's a it's it's not it's a higher power of my understanding. It's a spirituality more than it is a religion. And um, that's just kind of what I do. So I, I I always tell I'm that person that you'll meet me and within five minutes you'll find out that I'm in recovery. So gotcha. I'm very open about recovery. So. To everything you've been through, how is your life different today? How's my life different today? Wow. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm never longer driven by. So I. It's hard to say that, really. I mean, there's so many things that are different because in recovery, the first thing that you do is you just stop drinking and using, and you go to meetings and you meet with a sponsor and and you do the things they suggested, and it's almost like rinse, lather, and repeat. You keep doing the same thing to get some time. But then once the substance is gone, now you have the behaviors that are underneath it. And so I had to really work on, I had to be open to therapy. And I've done cognitive behavior therapy. I've done dialectical behavior therapy. Uh, I've worked in groups, um, processing groups to, to process through the behaviors that underlie the addiction. Um, and kind of like they call it peeling an onion. And so like once I peel a layer back, then there's another layer. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it's like I'm not ready to deal with everything at one time. And I don't think, I think sometimes... Uh, people in early recovery think, oh, wow, I'm sober now. Everything's going to be great. Right. And it's not. It's not perfect. And so uh, being able and willing to work through everything. <laughs> She's going to kiss me, isn't she? She is. <laughs> what has been your uh, biggest struggle? Gosh, my biggest struggle, I think, has been relationships. So um, I... As I discussed, those those four core addictions are all about codependence, mm -hmm. and I think um, removing the um, removing the substance, you know, being physically removed from the substance was difficult. Um, cocaine is not a it's not a addictive in the sense of it's not a physical withdrawal. It's not like heroin or opiates, but there was a mental withdrawal to it. And so, but the the thing for me was the hardest was rebuilding relationships and learning not only um, how to trust other people but how to show up as a friend, like. 
And how are you with that today? I'm much better. So yeah, I'm much better. I'm available to people. Um, I actually have deep, intimate relationships with people um, that love me and trust me and show up for me and I show up for them. And I didn't have that before when I was drinking and using. Even before it got bad, um, my life was very surfacey. It was very on the surface and we didn't have a lot of uh, deep conversations with people. So I have real conversations with people now. I have real relationships. Um, I have a group of women that, and a couple of guys too, but I know that I can call them 24 hours a day and they'll show up for me. And it's the reverse. They call me and I can show up for them. And whether it's get in my car and go see them or talk to them on the phone, um, I'm just a, a, a better supporting person. So, That's And I good. have healthier friendships and I have healthier love relationships too. Very good. And are you, you're giving back through the addiction community. Mm -hmm. Do the, do people who are also in recovery or beginning recovery. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. What are you doing? What do you give to the people that you sponsor? Sure. Um, well, I think what I bring to the table um, is not only my, my strong 12 steps in the and Alcoholics Anonymous program, but all the experience that I've had in, in therapy. I'm able to really kind of process that and be able to have help people by the, the therapy I've had. Um, the things I'm learning in school now is hard, starting to help my sponsees as, as well. Um, I speak at treatment centers on, on a monthly basis, and so I'm speaking with people in very young recovery, pick up a lot of sponsees that way, but also I think sometimes I'm that person, just like my first sponsor, that gives someone hope that things can change and things can get better. And, and what have you seen come from that? Have you seen one of your sponsees where they're peeling back their own onion and they are developing and what what has been your biggest reward from um, that? I, it's amazing every day actually because I mean even when sponsees don't get it the first time like maybe they're struggling and they relapse or they have they call it recurrence um it's amazing to see the light go off in their eyes because there's there's a a part of a part of AA is owning your own stuff like owning what you've done and um there's like for a long time we think that we're the victims in the world and that everyone else is causing our, us problems and there's a point when we're able to finally admit okay no I am the common denominator in a lot of my relationships and and I have to own my own what I'm doing um, it doesn't doesn't mean that they're bad people or they're to be let blame but it's just a point in time where they decide I'm not going to do this anymore and it's like is this behavior abhorrent do I want to continue doing it or mm -hmm. do I want to do, do something different yeah. and it's that moment when I watch the light go off in someone's eyes and they realize that, oh, if I keep doing this, I'm going to keep getting the same same stuff. So if I want to do something different, and then I help them, how do you, this is how you behave differently. And it's not an overnight affair. It's not something that happens right away. And uh, it's amazing to watch people kind of evolve and, like, and let them brighten up. And you see the, the life come on in their eyes again. And I've, I've witnessed to that. That is the most beautiful transformation. And you can see it in groups and process groups. When people walk in the door, they're broken. They don't, they don't, and that was there. I was that same person, and watching them be unbroken is beautiful. That is amazing. And what's the hardest part? <sighs> the hardest part? Uh, gosh, I don't really know. Like, um, I don't even know that's really hard. Um, because I had to learn boundaries, and for me, I think setting boundaries with people, like sometimes being firm. Um, people come to me uh, as a to be a sponsor because I'm kind of a hard ass, really. It's, Bad thing to say, but I it's tell them the truth. Perfectly great. Um, but I have a lot of compassion for them. Mm -hmm. I think the hard thing in recovery in general is meeting people and having relationships and friends. And some of us die. Some of us go back out, and some of us use again, and they don't make it back. And that's the hardest thing is to lose friends. So, what would you tell um, anyone who right now that be watching our show today is struggling and they don't know what to do? Can you get tell them what? would be this, what they could do and who they could reach out to? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think really the first step really is uh, be honest with yourself. Like, because people put me into treatment or I went to treatment for other people and it doesn't work. Like, it doesn't work. I can't get sober for anybody else. So when you reach that point, and I, I know I reached the point where I couldn't keep using and I didn't know how to stop using. Um, and uh, I'm lucky in the state of Minnesota we have lots of treatment centers but every state has all kinds of resources if you don't have the money for for treatment there are there are public funds there's also private scholarships for different places um, and there's it depends on what you're addicted to really you know like each treatment is going to be more specific to your addiction and to the 
to what you're kind of, what kind of you need help from. Um, but I would just encourage you to talk to somebody. Talk to a family member. Um, find out what your resources are. AA is free. NA is free. Um, there are some people who don't believe that's an effective treatment, but I, I think what it does bring is community. It brings you to a place where you're not alone. And I, I have to tell you that you're not alone. Like uh, the decisions we make as addicts, we make bad decisions and we have bad behaviors, but we're not bad people. And um, you know, we're not, we're not bad. So that's you know, so just reach out to people. Um, like I said, AA is free, NA is free. You can call your local mental health uh, board, um, and there's always like information lines where you can find more information okay. in your cities. So there's hope. You can also reach out to us here, and I can help you find find resources. So which Healing Hands, Kendra's partnered. Mm -hmm. She's a new addition to Hello. Healing Hands, <laughs> and she will be available. Please don't be scared. You can reach out. You hit the uh, little PM in Healing Hands, and you can say, yeah. "I need some help." And why and that's what she's here yep. for um, we're working to really broaden our um, our setting and our dynamics for you and that's where she'll come in mm -hmm. yeah I'd be she's glad to help so uh, and when I when I can't help I'll be honest to say I can't help but uh, anything that's said to me will be confidential I won't shred it out to anybody else um, I always hold confidentiality very very important um, and I always tell people I've Nothing you tell me will shock me. Like, I've probably done it. I've heard it. It's not shocking to me. So don't be afraid, I guess. You know, have courage. And if you feel like you need help, sometimes people say, well, I don't know if I have a drinking problem or not. Well, normal drinkers don't think that way. So if you're thinking you have a substance abuse problem, you probably have one. And there are tests you can figure it out. Um, there's all kinds of pamphlets and things like that. But just, it's really... I think sometimes it's not necessarily about the substance. It's if you're tired of living the way you're living and you want to change the way you're living, you have to take some steps to do it. Very good. And there we have it. And um, we're opening up the floor, of course, with love for you to interact with us and tell us what you, if you have any questions, which would be fantastic. Can your glasses? Hear that? Yes, my glasses disappeared. <laughs> I have a dog jumping around. <laughs> okay. What are so, our questions? So we have Amy on here. And she says, it, it isn't narcotics, but I am desperate to quit smoking. Mm. My addiction is severe, more the motion ritual of smoking than the nicotine. Any help or ideas? Regular yes. help doesn't work. <laughs> yes, nicotine actually is one of the highest. It's interesting because I think a lot of times drug conversations don't include nicotine. It's legal. It's easily to get. Uh, it's one of the most addictive substances ever. Um, the the things I've been reading lately is um, really some of the medical assisted um, withdrawal. And I know there's things like Chantex. Some people don't like Chantex. Um, but even um, effective using like nicotine patches um, to withdraw yourself slowly will help. Um, not smoking while you're on those is really important. Um, I've also had friends that I was never a smoker. I was really lucky with that. Um, you 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 can cover this. I'm an ex-smoker, so actually I can. Yeah. So I guess I'm finish also finish real quick. Also addicted. So mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I've heard other people say is if you switch to a natural tobacco that doesn't have the additives in it. Mm -hmm. So uh, like American Spirit, they're harsher, but they have just tobacco because typically we're addicted to the 13 other ingredients that are in cigarettes. That is how did you put it? Um, you have to make a decision yep. to quit, and to quit, you literally need to change your complete outlook. That means if you get up in the morning and the first thing you do is go from point A to point B, don't go to point A. Skip it completely. Mm -hmm. Go to point B. B. Makes sense. And you start changing your routine. And every time you would want to smoke, drink a bottle of water, mm -hmm. a glass of water. Well, and your body needs the water to help uh, detox. There was other yes. something that we were reading the other day about detoxing tobacco. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it a, was it turmeric? Turmeric. Mm -hmm. So turmeric will help you detox. Um, be careful about detoxing your body too quickly. Yes. That's why, like, you know, they'll have detox teas and things like that. Those are helpful, but make sure you're making sure you're, you're healthy. So what I did now, and not everyone could, not everyone's creative, but I, um, I crocheted a blanket in two weeks, a complete <laughs> king size blanket <laughs> when I first quit smoking. Um, I kept my hands very, very busy. She's agitated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it worked. 
and I have successfully not smoked for seven years. So she was talking about the ritual part, and I get that because um, I used to have the ritual of getting my drugs, and I understand it's almost like uh, even just thinking about it, you start to get sweaty pits, and yes. your hands get sweaty, and you almost can taste it in your mouth. Yes. So um, I know I've had friends um, take uh, uh, pins and cut the take the uh, take the ink out of the pen, put cotton in one end, and make it the length of the cigarette so that you can kind of have that mm -hmm. oral thing, and it still has mm -hmm. the tension on it, so you can suck on it. You can do that. Um, you could also just get a straw and okay. chew on it. I've done that. Um, I even put a rubber, little rubber band on my wrist, and every time it. I went to <laughs> want to go have a cigarette, I would snap it. I'd be like, hell, okay, I'm going to I don't want a cigarette now. I don't want one. But there's all different techniques. And not what worked for me, it's not going to work for you. It may or may not. So what we suggest is find what your triggers are, which makes you want to smoke. And then you start working at it from there. And one moment, Amy. No, that's the same one. Oh, same one. Same okay. One. Yes. <laughs> so um, I hope some of that's helpful. Uh, I wasn't a cigarette smoker myself, but I, I totally understand how hard it is. Because it is, like you said, you, you have a cup of coffee and you smoke yes. cigarettes. You drive in a car and you smoke a cigarette. Mm -hmm. But it really has to come down to decisions. decision that I don't want to do this anymore. And, um, you know, sometimes with my sponsees, I will have them write out what are the pros of smoking or the cons of smoking. You know, obviously some of the cons now are expense. Like, what could you do with that money? Where could you go with that money? Um, and if that's enough of an incentive to stop. Because really, um, addiction is about reward. And um, so if you reward yourself for doing good behavior, then you'll start to pick up that good behavior. Correct. And with you saying that, I did this. I went to Europe. Went to Europe for almost a month last year. On, your on my quit, cigarette, quit smoking cigarette. Maybe money. I should take up cigarette smoking <laughs> so I can save some money. <laughs> <laughs> what I did was I... Um, See, I bought them by the cart, and I didn't do the pack because I thought that was such a waste. And, you know, buy a pack at a time. It was cheaper to buy a carton. Yeah, and then I had them, and I never ran out because I was hostage. It's kind of like an alcoholic who has a wine cellar. Yes. <laughs> and so um, I knew what the carton cost. And so each week, 10 days, I would take, and I would put, and actually I didn't smoke a pack a day. I smoked Maybe a half a pack, if even that. But every 10 days, regardless, I would take account. that money and put it in. Mm -hmm. And it built up so quickly. So you figure my $1,800 <laughs> airfare, huh. my money through Europe. Time. And my time. Yeah, well, money. I mean, hotel. Nice. Um, I did spend some time with family. So, of course, that doesn't cost to stay there. Right. But I did a whole week in in um, London with my with friends and it was fantastic and it was so worth it so you just have to find what works for you yeah i agree with that yeah. what's your incentive is that helpful any other questions sometimes it's we have to find the, the current questions so i'm sorry if we're not getting the questions right away yeah, there's a little bit of a delay. Yeah, so please ask any questions that you have. And we did, we, we had some uh, confirmation on here, which is really nice. Kendra was my sponsor, and this <laughs> is from Rob. Hey, Rob. Uh, she was wonderful. She walks the talk. I'm proud to have her as my sweet girl be my sponsor. Oh, thank you so much, Rob. I love you. And as I mentioned earlier, for those that are just joining us today, Healing Hands has joined. Kendra has joined us. Mm -hmm. She's a wonderful new addition to Healing Hands. We're expanding because to become healthy and a healthier us, there's more sides to it. And as you've known from past uh, videos, which for those who are literally just brand new to us here at Healing Hands, you can go back and you can start watching the videos. We do have a YouTube channel. Yes, which we're developing. I haven't put the last couple ones on there, okay. but they will join. They will get on there. And, um, but I do want you to know that um, we have everything from anxiety, mm -hmm. communication, relationship issues, become, becoming vulnerable, unlearning negative behaviors, mm -hmm. and peeling back the layers. Yeah. 
So well, if there's something you want to see us cover, like that you, you're struggling with, um, mention in the comments, and we can. Basically, we're we're working on our own uh, out of our own experience, but we also do research and we talk to uh, to experts in the field. We're trying to bring to you the things that you want to hear. Okay. Let's see. This is good. this is my first time, so it's a little strange for yeah. me. I don't know where to look. <laughs> oh well, we're just looking at who's coming in, see, and their questions. And usually, what I do, and it's a lot e easier yeah, yeah. Friendly Sorry, for we'll me, later. is from here. But yeah. I may want to because I'm not seeing you it. You can't see down. that. Oh, I see. So, but we offer. There you um, go. There's lots of questions there. Yeah, but we want to go up because these <laughs> are the later ones. Okay. 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 That's exactly what I want to do with my money. Sick yeah. money. See, nice. Amy, you can do that. Yeah, you can and do it. You know something? I had such a blast. Mm -hmm. And do you know, every time I spent a dollar in Europe, take that, you freaking cigarette. And that's what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. And I mean, it was just, it, it was taking back my power mm -hmm. is what it was because I lived by the cigarette. I would say, I can't do that because I'll be there too long and then I can't smoke. Right. Or I don't want to go with them because they don't they they can't stand well, smokers. That's, that's what like that's how I did my addiction. You know, if yeah. I was gonna go somewhere, I either had a drink before I went there or finished when I when I you know. And eventually, when cocaine took over my life, I didn't go out. I didn't do right. things because you don't travel. You don't have the money to travel. I totally understand. And it's like this. It just gnaws at you, and it's just mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And you live your life around it. You live your life around it, and you plan your life around it. Yeah. And it's um I was I tell people that in recovery um. If I continue to be sober and doing recovery, my my future is limitless. And if I go back to using it again, within a brief short period of time, I can pretty much guarantee you what my life will look like. So that's that whole thing of I think of my finite brain and my infinite universe. And if I'm living in the infinite universe, not relying on my finite brain, then my my universe is, is mass is it's infinite. So my ideas don't control the possibilities. My I don't limit myself. So what would you tell um, anyone who has been, they have a block on their life right now and they, they've limited where they are and they're, they're not, they're at a stalemate in their life. How can they pull themselves from that to step out of their comfort zone? Yeah. Um, I think that's growth is, well, the growth starts at the, at the start of your comfort and uh, sorry, growth starts at the start of your discomfort zone. I mean, that's like, like being just being uncomfortable is mm -hmm. for me the biggest time of times of growth. Right. So like say, sometimes say people people will say lean into the into the pain or lean into this discomfort and trust like having a lot of trust and faith that it's going to work out. Okay. Um. But that trust and faith comes for me uh by having an understanding of oh God of my own understanding and I learned that I didn't have spirituality when I came into this program. I didn't I didn't believe in any kind of God or anything. But now I have. But I'm I'm as likely to take something from Christianity as I am to take something from from Buddhism or Islam. Like it's more about the power of goodness and the power of love. Um, I believe that we all are from love, and then we are all love bodies, and that um, that's what you know. That's that connection that we have between each other. Okay. So, um, what I would say is, um, if you feel like you're stuck and you need some help, is, is reach out to people. Reach out to people that you know. I, I'm guessing that most people know someone in recovery. Right. Somebody you've known someone that's that's addicted either to cigarettes or and they've conquered it or to alcohol or drugs and they've conquered that. Reach out to them and ask them for help and support in your city. Um, and like I said, you're welcome to ask questions here, and I'll personally answer them to you. And um, if I can help you find resources in your city, I'll, I'll be glad to do that. I have those at my fingertips. Yeah. But just trust that it will get better. Um, I think sometimes in my addiction, I got to the point where um, I had no hope. I was hopeless, and I thought that it would never get any better, that my life would never change, uh, that I could never do anything more than I was already doing. And I can, I'm, I'm living, talking, walking proof that life gets amazing when uh, I stop being controlled by my substances and by my relationships. And you've come a long way. Come a long way. <laughs> Does it? Do you feel victorious? It's almost like winning a race, or I can't explain it. It's like I have humility around it because I know that I didn't do it by myself. I mm -hmm. had help with uh, from professionals. I had help from sponsors. Um, I had help from God. I I say God because it's easier for me. Um, but I have a reliance on a higher power that I know every day I wake up and I say thank you for my recovery that I didn't do get this by myself. 
Um, so it's like I'm, I'm very proud of how far I've come, and I know I didn't do it alone. And I didn't do it not only to the people beside me, but the people behind me that I walk with today. Right. Me. So, right. Yeah. And we manifest. Mm -hmm. our, oh, the people, sure. we manifest our surroundings, we manifest our harmony yes. by bringing that, and we bring better people into our lives right. once we become at peace. Yes. We find that. I agree. And have you found that has been Oh, for safe? sure. Um, one of, the, one of the, the sayings I heard early recovery is you can start your 24 hours over any time during the day. And what I mean by that is, you ever notice that you like, you do something and it's a kind of like, you maybe spill coffee on your shirt in front in the morning, you're like, oh crap. And then I, I continue in that crappy mood, and things continue to go wrong all day long. But if I just kind of look at myself, oh, you know, it's just a little coffee, whatever, change shirts, and I don't really feed into that negativity, it gets better. And I've noticed that the more, actually a spiritual advisor told me one time, the more gratitude I have in my brain, the more positivity I have in my brain, the less room there is for negativity. It doesn't mean that I'm happy-go-lucky, uh, Pollyanna, that's like everything's good and happy. Things still happen in my life, but it's the, my reaction to it is a lot more even healed. I was always like this before, you know, and now I'm just kind of like, yeah, there's a little bit of up and down. It's kind of a, I'm more floating with the river and, um, you know, not trying to struggle and, and, and make things happen. Uh, I'm more willing to understand that the universe has powers and the universe has a bigger power than what I can imagine. Is there one thing through your journey? that stands out to you over everything? Just one thing that has happened, maybe something someone has said to you, maybe something you learned. I mean, just one instant, do it all. Wow. Um, it's, uh, I, you're gonna make me teary. Um, <laughs> I really think it's been the, my parents, like they have never stopped caring about me and loving me uh, despite my behavior. Um, but to know that they're really proud of me now and they're proud of um, my life and where it's going and they support me and, and they supported me even through my addiction and because they love me so much. Um, so, but being able to have a real relationship with them again and show up as a good adult and, um, not having this sense of entitlement that they owe me something. Um, and, um, that rebuilding that relationship has been really, that'd be the one thing that I'm so grateful for, mm -hmm. you know? Um, having relationships with people and just that love me is really important. Yeah. Let's see, that's fantastic. Yeah. And your relationship with your parents has improved. Yes, and, dramatically. And as you just heard her say, when we when we have something that controls our lives, it doesn't just control us; mm -hmm. it controls everybody, everything, and everybody around us. And why I say that is it affects them. Mm -hmm. So her actions while she was addicted, affected those she loved. There's even, you know, I know sometimes addicts say, well, I use alone, I don't really affect people, but I can tell you that if you have anybody in your life that loves you, you affect them. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to disclose, and I'm going to peel back a layer, <laughs> something that most people didn't know, and you're going to know today. I am the mother of an addict. The hardest thing I ever had to do was watch my daughter spiral out of control. To sit here with my hands in my lap, crying at night, because I didn't know if the next knock at my door was going to be the police saying they found her dead. So you have to realize that you have the support of your family mm -hmm. if you reach out, because we're there. I would have done anything in that moment if she would have come to me and said, Mom, I need help. I would have dropped everything because nothing else mattered at that moment. I would have been so grateful. And I did some dirty things to try to get her help. And I'm going to disclose that too. I lied. I told a big fib. Okay. My daughter was 15 years old and she was uh, hooked on crack cocaine. And, um, or crystal meth. Crystal meth. Crystal meth. Yeah. I was like, that's, okay. That's new crystal meth. Crystal meth. Yeah. And, um, she come in the house and her behavior was erotic. I mean, to the point where I, I, I fear for myself. She broke my thumb. Um, she said, and when I, and me, I just, I took her down. Never hit my kid. I took her down and I held her down and I called the cops. I didn't know what to do. They came and I told them what was going on. I needed her somewhere. 
I was trying to get her help. And these, luckily for me, the police officers that showed up were friends of mine. And he says, Don, and I go, yes. And he says, she threatened to kill herself, right? And I was getting ready to say no. He goes, she threatened to kill herself, right? And I was like, oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I got her admitted for, I think it was 16 days, because that's the max they will take them into, the, into one of our recovery units here without their consent. And I got her dried out. Was that the beginning of her recovery? No. Okay. But it's a start. She had enough methamphetamines in her system, from what they said, to knock a horse out. I believe that that may have helped her a little bit they because they did tell her that they had to give her shots and other stuff because she, she might have died that night. So th that was the best thing I could do for her. This is not an easy road for family and friends of an addict, and it's sure not an easy road for the addict. So don't be afraid. Yeah. Well, and um, it took me several attempts at recovery before I got it. And once I finally made the decision to get sober, it still took me another another year, year and a half before I could get sober. And um, there's just such a huge psychological and physic physiological um, addiction to substances. It doesn't go away overnight. And, you know, I used for 25 years. From the time I was 17 when I started drinking to the time I was 42 when I got sober, um, I didn't, I drew, very, I drew very few sober breaths. And so learning how to do life without drugs and alcohol was really difficult. And that's why I was willing to go to the halfway house because they taught me how to live a life that's sober, but they also gave me accountability. And there's a lot of support out there for people, um, not only in halfway houses, but in recovery communities. So um, learning from other people who've done it before you. Um, but it's hard for the addict. Um, it's hard, I mean, the, the destruction we cause in our families and our friends um, watching us die pretty much. Uh, it's really hard. Yes. And I'm living. And I'm, your, your daughter's sober now. My daughter's sober. She never went, she never went through recovery. So there's some things that she could do probably to improve her life. Uh, but she's not, she's so much better. I mean, she's 30. Oh my <laughs> goodness. <laughs> she's 34. And, um, yeah, I have a 34-year-old, guys. And she has been, since it, she's been sober since she was 24. That's good. Say, 24. That's really good. Yeah. So she's done really good, about 10 years. And, I mean, she, it's not that she, I think she doesn't have drinks. And when I say sober, it's a terminology that I've learned. Sure. It's not the alcohol being sober. It's off the drug. She didn't have a problem with alcohol mm -hmm. I had a problem with everything right so. she can she and can I'm learning that uh, in addiction treatment and in counseling um, some people are I do better abstinence based so I don't do any substances I don't I don't I don't think anything's good for me right um, some people feel like they can use drugs uh, well what I'm finding out is that there are a lot of people that can use drugs effectively without having problems but a lot of us do have either a genetic component or there is what's called psychosocial. So mm -hmm. there's a uh, there's a problem in, you know, for me, my family was incredible. Like I had an incredible loving family, but I felt different inside myself. And it was that feeling of not feeling like I, I, fit, I fit in with my, my social set that created a kind of a, a place for me to put drugs and alcohol. When I started drinking, I didn't feel that way anymore. And right. so um, it's, so you can have the most loving, incredible family and it's still it's still possible to be an addict. Yes, and that's what I'm guys I'm trying to say. And so, but, but as far as like the difference between sobriety and recovery, sometimes you take the drugs and alcohol away, and you still have the behaviors. And so, correct for me, what's important for me in my recovery is to address everything, which is peeling the onions back and going going to therapy and dealing with all the different things that that kind of co-occur with addiction. Um, and not every not everybody makes that choice. And so, what I've had to learn is also to accept everybody's definition their own definition of recovery mm -hmm. and that's what me and her had discussed is that the drugs and alcohol in conjunction were yeah were, were a problem right. Right. so um and i would say the baby not the baby baby he's five six six and she hasn't had anything to drink since then. oh yeah so, so i mean so she recognizes her own she's yeah. she, 
she's done well and i'm very proud very very proud because it's a it's a it's a long road now the recovery part is so different from just stopping mm -hmm. and this is where kendra's explaining and that is and this is where she's at you can totally stop the behavior but until you get to the roots of everything right. that has created that behavior you don't become whole in my experience in your experience, in my experience yeah I'm so, sure yeah, it's, it's subjective. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. so, I mean, it's owning things and it's owning your owning. I mean, getting up at the day and if you get it, if you become in a bad mood, obviously, because something happens that puts you in a bad mood, your first thing out of your mouth is, well, da da da, put me in a bad mood. No. I choose no. to be in that bad mood. You choose, choose because it. nobody has that kind of power no. to do this to you. And that's where the recovery comes in is owning your stuff mm -hmm. but of course that's her that's me yeah you oh, know this i know this yeah i only know my part <laughs> <laughs> so um eventually i mean that's my goal once i once i finish i i plan on becoming an addiction jill counselor. give us a heart hi jill <laughs> hey jill <laughs> one suggestion yes people who are addicted versus addict we are not our disease. Oh, yeah, that's true. I understand that. So, yes, um, we are not. So I'm actually starting to reevaluate the way I talk about myself because I tend to say I'm Kendra, I'm an addict. And the truth is I'm actually Kendra, I'm in recovery. And um, I was once addicted to a substance, but that doesn't make – I think sometimes when we call addicts addicts, it, it, it puts us separate. We're, like, different than – or we equate – I think some people equate – addict to criminal or theft or a bad moral morally bad person and the truth is that um we have a substance abuse disorder um and a different way of thinking about it is that um i lost my train of thought um <laughs> it happens um that we're not so it kind of goes back to that we're not bad people and that um we i guess the thing that that what I see, what I hope to see recovery change in the future is that we're no longer ashamed to be addicts, that we're more proud of being in recovery. Because so often because people identify as addicts or alcoholics, um, like I said, that stigma, that social stigma goes with it. And what I want to do is fight that social stigma because there are a lot of people who are addicted in this, in this United States that don't find help because they're ashamed. And I think hiding recovery um, only exacerbates that kind of stigma. And so... Yeah. That's why I said I'll be that person that you'll meet within five minutes. You'll know that I'm in, I'm in recovery because I'm very, very much proud of who I am. But I also know, know if that one moment when I say I'm in recovery, will it help somebody? Right. Um, and so is that, is that, does that cover it, Jill? <laughs> um, she says you are a rock star. Oh, rock star. Cool. <laughs> See, validation. I need validation. <laughs> uh, and there you go. And that's what she's saying. And that is that you have to be proud of yourself. And everything and everything you have overcome because we have so many obstacles in our life and it doesn't matter if it's addiction mm -hmm. or if it's coming from an abusive relationship mm -hmm. or overcoming things such as bipolar because you are not you you can't define yourself yeah you're not you're not defined by your disease right and so so there's help out there exactly so it's working through everything and saying this is who I am, and you know something? This is what happens in my life. This is what is going on, and I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. And if someone doesn't accept it or accept you because of the stigma, then that's their own personal bias, and therefore they're irrelevant. They're either going to learn to come to accept it, or they won't. And you can't change somebody's mind. You just can't. Mm -hmm. no. They they're gonna feel and think and say what they want. Uh, learning that learning that I was okay with myself was the most important thing. Um, that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like everybody in this world and not everyone's gonna like me and that's really okay. Like that's mm -hmm. just like I can't like everything or every, everyone in the world. Not every everything or everyone in the world will like me and I don't base my value anymore on what people uh, are saying about me or what people think about me. Um, I also believe in living with life full integrity. So if I'm living a certain way. If someone says something about me that doesn't go with the way I behave, then I, it's it's like I live in such a way that when you, someone says something bad about you, they don't believe it. Right. And I believe in that. I believe in living a life of integrity and honesty. 
And that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Exactly. And that's the way. It makes and, it a lot easier. <laughs> and that brings me to a question. Through your road to recovery, have you ever met somebody? And your phone rings. <laughs> One moment, please. <laughs> I didn't, it was a spontaneous, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Through this road to recovery, and you are so giving and so open about who Kendra is, which I admire very much. Yes. Have you ever come across somebody who has made you say, whoa, because they stigmatized you right away? And you could feel it within the instant you told them that they closed off. I really haven't. Like, it's been really, it's been a really positive experience for me. Um, you know, like, uh, I think... I think people really appreciate the honesty that I bring to the table. Um, mm -hmm. I've never, I've never had someone Kendra, say that. I've never had someone say that to me. So, um, so I've never had someone say that to me and, and like stigmatize me at all. I have. I think sometimes what happens is we personally feel it, and we feel ashamed, and then therefore we're not uh, willing to be open about our addiction. And so um, I've never had anyone mistreat me. Um, not since I started living. The way I should live, you know, when I was lying and cheating and stealing, of course they should do it differently as they should have. But during this time of meeting people, have you ever noticed, ha have you come across someone who you've become friends with or acquaintances with, and then all of a sudden they kind of drift away? No, I haven't. I actually haven't. So what would you suggest to somebody? If someone has that? Has happened? that happened to them? Um, I, I guess I would suggest that that not everyone's going to feel that way. I mean, there are some people that have that opinion about drugs and alcoholics or, or alcoholic and drug addicts, but again, like Jill was suggesting, there's a difference between addiction and the addict, right? So right. you aren't your behavior. And if, if a person can't understand that you aren't your behavior, then that's maybe a person that you don't really quote-unquote need in your life, I guess. Um, it's harder if it's a family member. Um, realizing, I, I, I see a lot of times uh, in people in early recovery are upset because their family doesn't immediately trust them. Realizing that our behaviors happen over time, and that our addiction has caused um, issues over the years, that it's not going to be it's not going to be overnight solution. So, I mean, a good example is I used to take my mom's car and go you know go to the store, and I'd be gone for an hour. And of course, I was going and buying drugs, and I was using drugs, and you know, and when I first got sober, she would allow me to go to the store, but she was on the phone with me, like you know, within 10 minutes, are you coming home? You know, and she was really upset and nervous. And I didn't at first understand that my behavior had created this sense of fear in my mom. And so I had to learn to respect that she was going to check in on me. And still to this day, she checks in on me. If I don't call her every few days, she worries about me. And I don't get upset at it because um, I know that it's my behavior that caused that. And so, um, you know, I would suggest just trying to find other people that do support you and that don't stigmatize you. Because they're out there. There's a whole community out there. Mm-hmm. And for those that are in your life, and this, uh, I'll speak from, again, being the mother of an addict, and that is, it takes, it takes time. There's trust. It, you have to look at it as being in a relationship, like, and you were cheated on, or somebody lied to you, and you feel betrayed. And that's the feeling that say somebody, a family member, like myself, feels when you're the family member of an addict because there's always, okay, you're doing better. When is the next shoe going to fall? Right. Are you going to relapse? Do I need to lock, lock my purse up? Do I need to live in my home when you're here like a prisoner because I'm afraid mm -hmm. that if I don't, you're going to steal everything to go on it to get your next right well and that's the thing as an addict finally that was the only only my own stuff part is understanding that the way I behaved affected other people and created in them fear and anger and angst and anxiety that I wasn't willing to look at all the time and um, you know when uh, part of the AA program is making amends with friends and family affected um, you're affected by your drug and, and alcohol use and um, you know, it's not, it's not, I'm, I took your money, I'm sorry, I did it because I'm an addict. It's, I took your money because I'm selfish and self-centered and I don't really care about you. I prefer to have my money and my drugs. So, we have a question coming in. Well, um, Anne, Annie, mentioned that she loved that Jill brought up, brought that up because as you know, Kendra, this has been a huge issue 
for me and mm -hmm. that I beat myself up continually over my past and what I have done makes me a bad person. Mm -hmm. Today, I know that I am not my disease and that I am a woman on grace and integrity. And I tell myself that every day that I am beginning to believe. Kendra, you are a huge role model and I appreciate you very much. You and your sobriety are an inspiration for me. Plus, I miss the K grill or whatever that place was. The oh. great breakfast. <laughs> yes. Uh, keys. We went to go keys. We had a really good pancakes. Okay. And he, okay. Yeah, good am omelets. So yeah, what Annie said is is true. I think so many times we we confuse our behavior with our value, and the decisions we make, particularly when addicted, aren't decisions we would make when we're sober. Uh, and uh, it it takes time. And and you know, she's a great friend, and uh, it, she inspires me as well. Like that's the you were asking me before what inspires me. New young recovery inspires me. People that that get knocked down and get back up and dust themselves off and keep going because the perseverance that, you know, this disease takes so many of us. And so not to give up, not to just roll over and die is really important. And um, it's just uh, learning that you aren't, you aren't what you've done in the past is important. Very good. Okay. I think we've been good. Right. We right. are, but we do want to leave it. If anyone has any questions, we'll give it a moment. If not, what we will do is give it a few hours and I'll answer anything she'll you have answer questions. anything you have, any questions. If you don't feel confident to reply in this thread, don't worry about it. Hit the PM like you were sending a message. It says send message and you can answer it. We'll answer it. So I just want to, th I want to thank my friends for chiming in and saying hello. It really touches my heart. Um, that's like the best thing of recovery is having people that show up for me. And um, thank you for inviting me here. I appreciate you. And thank you for joining Healing Hands. And I hope to be a bigger part of this. So yeah. this was fun. So everyone, I want to wish you to have a wonderful evening. And Healing Hands is grateful that you joined us today. And we're going to say good night. Good night. <laughs>